it's in 15 minutes when we continue our coverage of the World Chess Championships. Now on BBC Two, the news and sports with Jenny Bond and Rob Bonnet. Police investigating the series of IRA bombings in London are holding five men under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. They were arrested after the IRA bombers targeted North London for the third time in a week with two separate attacks. The Irish President and Prince Charles joined forces in Warrington to launch a new campaign for peace. And as the Americans send in more troops to Somalia, General Ideed calls for a ceasefire. Good evening. Five men have been detained and are being questioned under the Prevention of Terrorism Act in connection with the latest spate of bombings in London. Two of the arrests were made in Staffordshire and the other three men were detained in North London. Last night there were two explosions in the capital, in West Hampstead and at Staples Corner near Cricklewood. They caused damage but no one was hurt. The IRA have admitted they did it but it's not known if the arrests are linked to the latest explosions. The latest victims of what appears to be a sustained terrorist bombing campaign in North London were clearing up this morning. One blast badly damaged a row of shops in West Hampstead shortly before midnight. At the time, police, fearing more devices, cordoned off the area. Witnesses recalled a loud explosion. We felt heat, we heard glass, we felt the, the floor shake underneath us and we just ran for life, we ran for cover. The other blast, a little earlier, was at Staples Corner, where 18 months ago a 100-pound IRA bomb caused massive damage. This time a carpet retailer's was hit and the effects were much less serious. The explosions follow three last Saturday near Swiss Cottage, where there were minor injuries, and five around Highgate on Monday, when no one was hurt. Police say two men were arrested in Staffordshire earlier today and three more in North London. All five are now being questioned in London police stations, having been detained under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Mike Smart, BBC News, Central London. The Prince of Wales and the Irish President, Mary Robinson, have been at the launch of a peace project in Warrington. The aim is to foster better relations between Ireland, Northern Ireland and Britain. Two young boys from the town, Tim Parry and Jonathan Ball, were killed in an IRA bomb in March. Colin and Wendy Parry attended the launch, hoping some good might yet come from the death of their son, Tim. In her speech, the Irish President Mary Robinson praised the people of Warrington. It's clear to me that there is, at the community level, in Ireland and Britain, a strong awareness of the futility and injustice of violence, and a burning desire for peace. After the bombing, the families of the children who died received massive public support. Colin Parry said that now it was up to people on all sides to build on that feeling. Politicians, church leaders and other community leaders must not be allowed to rest between atrocities carried out by both sets of extremists. They are charged with the job of tackling the causes of violence. No previous popular initiative for peace in Northern Ireland has attracted such high-profile support. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Sir Patrick Mayhew, said he hoped the peace process, which broke down last year, might resume. But he restated the government's firm line against negotiating with terrorists. It simply isn't reasonable to expect people to sit down and talk about constitutional matters for the government of Ireland, North or South with people who reinforce their arguments with a bomb or a bullet when it suits them. Prince Charles spoke to the victims of the bombing, including Mrs Bronwyn Vickers, who lost a leg in the explosion. When they last met, okay. Mrs Vickers was still being treated in hospital. Kevin Bacay, BBC News, Warrington. The Somali warlord, General Ideed, has called on his troops to stop attacking UN peacekeepers and said he was willing to negotiate a ceasefire with the United States. Ideed made the announcements in a broadcast tonight on his personal radio station. He welcomed what he said was President Clinton's call for peace. American reinforcements pouring into Mogadishu are presenting the tough side of the new US policy towards Somalia. 18 heavy tanks and more than 40 armoured cars are due in the next few days beef up the American presence here. But at the same time, the US is now making it very clear that it doesn't want the hunt for the fugitive faction leader, General ID, to continue. The warlord has been on the run since early June, when his forces killed 24 Pakistani peacekeepers. 
but he has managed to evade capture for four months, and more than 70 peacekeepers have been killed in the guerrilla war he has launched on the streets of Mogadishu. Admiral Jonathan Howe, the senior UN official in Somalia, was the architect of the Get ID policy, and US officials are pinning the blame on him for turning the UN operation into what they call a personal vendetta. Robert Oakley, the American diplomat who helped to start the intervention in Somalia in December, is now being brought in by Washington to try to get a ceasefire with General Ideed over the heads of the UN. Tonight, General Ideed's radio station announced that he favored a ceasefire, and the way seems open towards peace in Somalia. Roger Hearing, BBC News, Mogadishu. The state of emergency in Moscow is being extended by the military authorities there for another week. An overnight curfew is also to remain in force. The measures, imposed as a result of the failed rebellion by the Russian parliament a week ago, were due to expire tomorrow. President Yeltsin has also dissolved thousands of city councils throughout Russia. Some of them have resisted his economic and political reforms. Muslim forces in central Bosnia have launched a new series of attacks in the worst fighting in the area for some weeks. The Muslims are trying to take an enclave held by Croats at Vitez, where British UN forces are based. The Muslim attack, masked by the surrounding woods, was a heavy one. A coordinated assault using infantry and artillery, they came from three directions. On the northern front, they had the advantage of height. The Croats were resisting fiercely in the valley below and reinforcing where they could, but they were taken by surprise. This is the most serious fighting there has been here for three weeks. It bears all the signs of a Muslim offensive north and south of Vitez and a desperate defense by the Croats. British UN troops are less than a mile from the fighting. It's beyond their mediation and they're staying out of it. Local people don't have that luxury. If the front line goes, the town goes. It's most vulnerable on the southern front, where the fighting was house to house and the Muslims are still close. The closest range is down there, 100, 120 meters. Mujahideen. The attackers were identified as Mujahideen from outside the country. These Croats just held them off. It was a probing attack continuing this evening. The main assault is still expected before winter freezes the front lines. Martin Bell, BBC News, Vitez. Two Israelis have been killed by Arab gunmen near the city of Jericho in the occupied West Bank. The two were believed to have been hiking in the area, a popular tourist spot. Magistrates meeting in London have voted overwhelmingly to reject government proposals to streamline the management of courts. The vote followed a speech by the Lord Chancellor, Lord Mackay, assuring them that the changes would not affect their judicial independence. The Lord Chancellor arrived to try to sell his proposals to what he knew would be a hostile audience. Magistrates are in unusually militant mood over the plans. They say the move to increase efficiency in the courts could lead to government interference, as for the first time the Lord Chancellor would have a say in the management of the courts. Lord Mackay gave this reassurance. The changes I have proposed will not interfere with judicial independence. As confirmation of my position on this, I shall intend to enshrine in the law a guarantee of the judicial independence of the magistrates. But the magistrates believe this will be impossible to deliver in practice. They object to losing control over justices' clerks who give legal advice. They'll be put on performance-related contracts, which magistrates fear will leave them open to outside pressure. At the end, the vote against the Lord Chancellor was overwhelming. The fear is that in court on the day, the Justice Clerk's advice will somehow have been tempered and tampered with by management and interference coming from the government. But the Lord Chancellor plans to introduce legislation in the next session of Parliament. The magistrates say they'll fight him all the way. June Kelly, BBC News at Guildhall. The leader of the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela, has been given the freedom of nine British cities and districts. At a ceremony in Glasgow, Mr Mandela said the Scottish community had been a source of tremendous strength to him and his comrades while he was in prison. He also appealed for help to ensure that next April's elections in South Africa were free and fair. Now, with news of today's football and the rest of the sport, here's Rob Bonnet. Hibernian have moved ahead at the top of the Scottish Premier Division after a 2-0 win at Motherwell. Darren Jackson set the Edinburgh side on their way with a first-half goal. Keith Wright got the other one. And a goal from Pat McGinley helped Celtic to their first home league win of the season at the end of a turbulent week. 
It was also a win for Glasgow rivals Rangers, only their second in nine matches. Peter Hustra scored twice in a 3-1 victory at Dundee United. So Rangers go fifth. Above them, Aberdeen, despite losing at Partick, Kilmarnock, who drew at Wraith, and Motherwell, who now trail Hibs by two points. Today was a rest day in the FA Carling Premiership prior to England's international next Wednesday. Attention therefore focused in England on the first division, where Tranmere went top by beating Bolton 2-1 with a late winner from Pat Nevin. An Alan Pardew penalty won Charlton the points at Barnsley, but wasn't enough to take Charlton above Crystal Palace, whose match at Leicester was postponed. Middlesbrough played tomorrow. Derby beat Luton 2-1. England manager Graham Taylor's preparations for next Wednesday's important World Cup qualifier in Holland have been hampered by injuries to key players. Today, the Queen's Park Rangers striker Les Ferdinand withdrew with a ha the damaged hamstring and there were other absentees at training this morning. Pierce, Wright and Adams are all uncertain starters in Rotterdam. Ince and Walker are ill and even goalkeeper David Seaman failed to train today after walking into a ladder and sustaining a wound that needed four stitches. Mr Taylor's team may not be announced until the day of the match from which England need a draw but will play for a win. The worst thing that could happen is to go out to Rotterdam to try to play for a draw and lose. It's happened once in this World Cup qualifying games against Norway and I'm certainly not prepared for that to happen again and neither are the players. Amongst all the uncertainty, Blackburn's Alan Shearer now looks set to make his international comeback after 11 months away. The reigning champions Bath have maintained their 100% record in Rugby Union's Courage League. Their latest victory came at Wasps by 19 points to 13. The meeting of last season's top two teams in the Courage League proved as bruising and uncompromising as expected. Bath opened up a six-point lead before half-time with three Callard penalties to one from Rob Andrew for Wasps. Just a minute into the second half, England's Stuart Barnes fashioned a typically incisive break which helped Bath go further ahead with the game's first try. The scorer, Mike Catt, playing in place of the injured Jeremy Guscott. Then, as Bath increased their pressure on the Wasps line, they were awarded a try to the England number eight, Ben Clark. Wasp protested that Clark hadn't grounded the ball over the line, and his reaction betrayed what might have been a piece of good fortune. 19-6 down, Wasps rallied in the closing stages and earned what was destined to be a consolation try through centre Graham Childs with two minutes left. But then, in injury time, Wasps thought they'd snatched an unlikely victory as Dean Ryan attempted to force his way over. This time, however, the referee said no. Bath survived and eventually held on to win 19-13. A fourth successive league title is already beckoning. Duncan Jones, BBC News. Chris Eubank will start tonight's WBC super middleweight fight at Old Trafford as a clear favourite to take the title from the champion Nigel Benn. Eubank, unbeaten in 39 fights, has already beaten Benn once in Birmingham three years ago. The champion, nicknamed the Dark Destroyer, will be a pound lighter for the contest for which he'll be paid £1 million. Pounds. Eubank will receive £200,000 less. And you can hear commentary on the fight on BBC Radio 5 at half past ten. Jenny. And that's it from us for now. The main news on one tonight is at 10 to 10.